for sharing your slide. Yeah, Michael is going to tell us about quaternion suppression from numerical solutions to the limb body equation at the leading and next leading order. Mike, please take it away. Okay. Thanks, Xiaojun, and thanks to all of the organizers for making this very interesting workshop happening happen and uh, you know opening up some line of communications between various communities. So when uh, in the title I, I list leading order and next to leading order, in this case I mean next leading and next to leading order in the bind ratio of the binding energy over the temperature, and that will become clear towards the end of the talk. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to present the stuff that's been published already, um, together with the Munich group, Brambilla, uh, Viro, Vandegrind, and uh, Berlin, Johannes Weber, and now Santiago Miguel. And um, also, I advertise here that um, all of the results that you'll see today um, have been documented the code is released publicly you can download it and all of the documentation is available here this has also been published um, if you're interested all right so the the physics problem that we're trying to address is the suppression of bottom onium states in the quark on plasma it was a predicted uh, long ago that um, if you were to embed a, a bound state of a BB bar pair or any heavy quark pair for that matter in the quark and plasma, um, that what would happen is that there would be device screening between the uh, of the interaction. And because of this screening, um, what used to be a bound state that might be sitting here, for example, in the potential will at some temperature eventually uh, become dissociated. Um, in the intervening uh, 30 years or so, um, we learned that there was an, another important effect, and that is that essentially uh, there's plasma particles bouncing off of these bound states all the time, and this leads to larger spectral widths. Now, we've heard about this as, you know, the imaginary contribution to the uh, potential for, for uh, quark and anti-quark, and so that's, that's the second piece. So we have both things going on, and, and we need a formalism that can take into account both the, the screening of, uh, of the potential, which is reflected in the real part, and uh, these widths, which are reflected in the imaginary part. The experimental observable that's used for this um, is to observe the number of upsilon 1s, 2s, and 3s states as a function of uh, dimuon invariant mass, because the, these states can decay to a photon that then decays to a dimuon pair. And by reconstructing uh, the invariant mass of these dimuon pairs, you can read off um, the 1s and the 2s and the 3s. The left bottom panel shows um, data collected by LACB at, at root s of 7 TeV um, in a PP collision. Now, theoretically, what we expect because of these two effects, the, the by screening and the, and the larger spectral widths, is if we were to jack up the temperature and look at the same plot, we would, we would see a much, much broader uh, peak for the 1s, 2s, and 3s, and we would see also suppression in the form of the, of the peaks going down. Now, reality is a little bit complicated because we can't just create a quark on plasma um, at, at this temperature and hold it there. Uh, eventually, the thing is going to cool back down and, and states will go back to having their vacuum widths and, and then they're detected. But during their traversal of the, of the plasma, their spectral function might look like something like this. Now, <clears throat> this observable is particularly nice because it's something that you can, you can see with your, your naked eye. So on the left, I show data from uh, CMS. This is with the background normalized, so we can very nicely see the 1s, 2s, and 3s uh, peaks in, in the PP collision. And on the right, I show uh, data also from the CMS co uh, collaboration, but collected in a lead-lead collision. And uh, that's the, the little black dots down here with a, a blue line going through them. And as you can see, we no longer see a, a 3S peak. Uh, the 2S is strongly suppressed, and we even see suppression of, of the ground state 1S uh, sitting here. Now, what uh, experimentalists report to us is something called RAA, 
which is the ratio of what they measure in lead lead to what they expect to get if uh, you were to just imagine that a, a nucleus nucleus collision, lead lead collision, was just a bunch of nucleon nucleon collisions. So you can just scale up by the average number of binary collisions and that will give you what's, what I call here on the plot the PP scaled result. So we can see that compared to the expectation of you know, just independent nucleon scattering, we see that there's a very strong suppression. And by just simply taking the ratio of these peaks, you can essentially read off what is RAA. And we can see this now with our naked eye. And uh, now the question is, how do we then um, make theoretical predictions for this observable and, and others? So the, one of the main themes of this uh, meeting has been uh, the application of open quantum systems. And uh, I won't go, we had very nice talks uh, in the last couple of days about this. Um, the summary is that we can conceptually divide the entire system into a probe and the medium. The medium is consisting of light quarks and, and gluons, which comprise the bulk of the QGP. And then the probe is this uh, is our heavy quarkonium state. And then we can decompose the total Hamiltonian into a, a probe part, a medium part, and then, of course, some interactions uh, between the two. Now, if we consider the total system, which was probe plus medium, we can write down the total density matrix simply as, as a, a sum over um, all the, all the um, eigenstates in the system with, with the probability to be in, in each eigenstate. And we know that um, this thing evolves in time by you know, a familiar rule uh, that is just the commutator between the total Hamiltonian and the, and the total density matrix. If we integrate out these uh, medium degrees of freedom, then we get something called the reduced density matrix, just, which just describes the probe uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, that's why I label it row probe here. And uh, in general, what you get instead of this equation is, is called a master equation. And in certain limits, this master equation will assume a Lindblad form. Generally speaking, when, when the, um, the time scale for re-equilibration of the, of the medium is fast enough, you're going to have a Markovian process and that's going to drive you into this Lindblad form. But in general, um, they're called master equations. In, uh, in the quark on plasma, there's a bunch of relevant scales that we need to worry about. There's the temperature of the plasma itself, the mass of the bound state. In this case, um, the mass of an upsilon is on the order of 10 GeV, so this is much, much greater than the temperatures that we generate in a heavy ion collision, which are maximum on the order of, say, 700 MeV at the earliest times after the nuclear pass-through. There's also the, the scale, which is associated with the, the size of the bound states themselves, and you know, classically that's just the Bohr radius because uh, at least in the, in the limit that we're going to be looking at, you can treat these uh, states to first approximation as coulombic states. And uh, for bottom, uh, the Bohr radius is, is small, so we're going to exploit the, the, the fact that the bottom onium has a small uh, Bohr radius. Of course, there's also the Debye mass, which sets another scale, which is the screening length in the system. And then finally, there's the binding energy of the states themselves. Now there's a, a systematic way to um, go from the full QCD Lagrangian by first integrating out the, um, the hard scale associated with the bound state mass, because this is much, much greater than the temperature. Um, you can do a perturbative matching here um, and it's independent of, of the temperature in fact. The next, and that results in uh, what we heard yesterday was non-relativistic QCD. If we further inter integrate out um, the scale associated with the bound state uh, size, then we get down to this um, potential non-relativistic -relativist, QCD. Uh, and in this, there's a Lagrangian, which is expressed uh, solely in terms of singlet and octet degrees of freedom, the bound states themselves, um, plus interactions uh, between them uh, and, and gluons in the system, which are, are encoded as dipole interactions. Now, um, for determining whether or not you have a, you know, a general master equation or a Lindblad equation, what you have to look at is the separation of the various time scales. There are three time scales that are relevant. There's the medium relaxation time scale. That's how fast does the medium re-thermalize itself due to it from a perturbation. And uh, generically, this is going to be proportional to one over the temperature of the medium. 
there's an in intrinsic probe time scale, which is related to the level spacing of, of the of our sort of hydrogen-like atom, which is our bottom onium state. So this is uh, one, parametrically one over the binding energy. And then there's the probe relaxation time, which is related to how long it takes for the probe uh, momentum, center of mass momentum in this case, to be randomized. And uh, within this framework, you can write down um, what, what this is parametrically. And if you, if you are working in the limit that you have a very, very small uh, uh, bound state, so that this is a large number, and that's much, much greater than uh, the binding energy of the state, and uh, then we don't have to assume anything particular about the ordering of T and MD. That's why we can call it a strongly coupled quark gluon plasma, because uh, typically MD is G times T, but you know, if G is large, there, there need not be any separation between these two scales. And in this paper from, or a couple of papers from 2016 and 2017, Nora, Miguel, Jan Soto, and, and Anton showed that the um, PNRQCD master equation then reduces down to this Lindblad form, where the first term is looks familiar. It's a, it's a commutator between a Hamiltonian and the probe, um, but now this is the, the reduced density matrix. But then you get some additional terms which involve these things called jump operators. These jump operators include internal transitions in the state. So if we had, for example, in an Upsilon 1s in the singlet configuration, of course, by absorbing a gluon, it can go to a P wave in the octet uh, configuration. And those are encoded in these jump operators. So these are, are the internal uh, transitions in the system. And uh, we're going to assume throughout here that we obey this uh, particular ordering of the, of the scales. Now, it turns out to be uh, convenient and useful to reorganize this Lindblad equation by grouping together um, this first term, which is the commutator term, and this uh, second term over here that I've highlighted in red. Now, the reason that is convenient is because this um, product CN dagger CN is the um, partial decay width in the nth uh, channel. And if I sum over all channels, this gives me the total decay width. So I can um, just put these two terms together and I can then define an effective Hamiltonian, which is the original real valued um, Hermitian probe Hamiltonian minus this, um, this width, width term. And so the effective Hamiltonian evolution here is non-Hermitian. By rewriting it, I can then see that I get um, my time evolution of the, uh, of the reduced density matrix. It looks like a commutator term now, but it's, it's complex. So we, we can't assume that, that H dagger is H. Um, and so this is the sort of classical evolution without transitions, that's the red term. And then the second term here is these internal transitions between the different states. Now to proceed, um, we of course need to derive what is H effective, and we need to derive what are all the jump operators that we need um, to, to actually specify the equation. So I, I won't go through the details of the derivation. They're presented in these, these two papers. Um, it proceeds as follows. You take the reduced density matrix and you decompose it into singlet and octet sectors, and then you can further decompose it into angular momentum, but let's not go there yet. Let's just stop it, decomposing it into singlet and octet sectors. Then the, the probe Hamiltonian um, is also uh, decomposed into these same blots. This is the singlet Hamiltonian that has the attractive uh, singlet potential, and this is the octet Hamiltonian that has a repulsive octet potential. And um, at leading order in the binding energy over the temperature, um, there's a correction uh, which comes with a coefficient, which is called gamma, which I'll define in a second, um, and is simply proportional uh, to R squared. And this, because it modifies the, the real part of the Hamiltonian, uh, corresponds to sort of the screening effect. This is the, the mass shift um, that I was talking about in the phenomenology slide. Um, these jump operators can be written down once you decompose into singlet and octet uh, blocks, and um, they're 
proportional to an, another constant, which is called kappa, which is related to the uh, heavy quark moment, momentum diffusion. There's some Casimirs flying around. Uh, and they have a matrix structure, which is encoding these transitions between singlet and octet, or octet and singlet, or octet and octet. And at least for an isotropic system, um, there are six of these collapse operators that encode all of those possible transitions. And then if I go back here and I then uh, compute gamma n, sum over all uh, uh, collapse operators, then I can write down a um, nice analytic expression for um, the width of the state. And again, it's, uh, it's quadratic in the radius and it has some non-trivial uh, color structure. Now these two constants, as I mentioned, there's gamma and kappa. These can be fundamentally related to time ordered um, expectation values of chromoelectric fields in the plasma. Uh, with kappa um, being related to the real part and gamma uh, being related to the imaginary part. Um, the nice thing about this is that from this, this kind of definition, this is a quantity that you can just go and measure on the lattice. Gamma is a little bit more tricky and so far there have, as far as I know, been no direct measurements, but um, you can, um, you can um, infer it indirectly by looking at the mass shifts from the spect spectral reconstructions. So um, again, these jump operators are going to encode um, all of the possible transitions. If we further decompose this into orbital angular momentum, um, we can, these jump operators will also um, uh, enforce the selection rules that we know that have to be there. For example, as I mentioned earlier, if you're starting a singlet, I can absorb a gluon and I can go to an octet state, but I have to change to L is equal to one. But I can also, once I get there, I can start jumping down over here, over here, over here, back down <laughs> over here, and do any kind of dance through this quantum number space that, that I can imagine. Now, if it keeps going up through this chain, then I, I essentially lose the state if it comes unbound. But there is a possibility that I can make a round trip through, through this and end up back in singlet. And that would be a kind of quantum regeneration of the state um, in its evolution. Now, the, the next thing we need to, um, to fully specify these equations are the values of, of these, um, these coefficients, gamma and kappa. And as I said, these are things that you can get from the lattice. So what we use in practice um, um, are the measurements that were done in this paper um, by, uh, by this, this group of people. And they provided a nice plot as a function of T over TC of the scaled um, momentum diff diffusion coefficient. The measurements are these black um, bars here. And then they made some fits um, from the PNRQCD prediction for, the, for these or, uh, coefficients or NRQCD, I should say. And then uh, you, you can then come up with an analytic function that describes the temperature dependence of this, this transport coefficient. As we see, as T gets lower, this, this gets larger, and as T gets very large, this, this goes to zero. The, um, so what we're going to use is um, this blue band here, and all the lines will be, the, uh, the central values will be this dotted blue line that's running here, and then we're gonna vary kappa over this range shown here. As I mentioned on the previous slide, is less known about uh, gamma at this point in time. There's been some measurements, but the, the early ones um, uh, showed a very large negative values. But as we move forward in time, they seem to be getting still negative, but closer to zero. And, and the most recent measurements by looking at the mass shifts from, from Petrescu et al. are, are showing that it it's, uh, can be consistent with zero. So. Um, out of an abundance of caution, we, we just allow it to vary over this full gray band here from minus 3.5 to zero. So that's what we're going to use for those transport coefficients. So now we have specified all the terms. We know what the H effective is. We know what all the jump operators are, and we know the transport coefficients that are appearing there. And now we want to solve this equation um, numerically. Now, if you follow this procedure, as I described on the previous slide of decomposing it into octet singlet and then also angular momentum states, um, for what you'll find is that this becomes a very large matrix equation. 
And as you start sending uh, the angular momentum cutoff to infinity, you'll find that the matrix that's sitting here gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Additionally, we're going to have to discretize the, the um, wave functions that are underlying the reduced density matrix. And in practice, um, we found that you need a very large lattice. And by very large lattice, I'm talking about like 1,024 or 2,048 points. So couple that with L max getting large, and suddenly you have a very large matrix problem to solve. And, and this typically scales like the number of elements in the matrix cubed. Um, there are certain optimis, optimized algorithms that might get you down to like 2.3 or something, but this is always going to go as a power of the, of the matrix size. So um, that you quickly run into problems. Not only is it slow, uh, you can't even fit it on, in one computer's memory. So if you try to follow this, this, uh, this uh, strategy, um, you're going to find that the, the computation becomes very, very challenging. So we need a, a better, faster uh, method, uh, which we can easily parallelize. And uh, that method um, we're going to steal from essentially the quantum optics people. <laughs> and that's called the quantum trajectories method. And the method relies on this split that I showed you earlier that, that I can separate it into this sort of uh, non-Hermitian Hamiltonian evolution and some internal transition term. It's important to note that um, during um, this, it, it, if you just evolve with this part, the blue part here, um, the quantum numbers won't change. If I start in a um, L is equal to zero singlet state, I will just evolve and I will stay right there. If I start over here, I'll just evolve and I'll stay right there. But during this time, um, because the effective Hamiltonian is non-hermitian, the uh, norm of the wave function will drop as a function of time. So the algorithm proceeds by first generating a random number between zero and one. Let's say it's 0 0.5 that got generated. We evolve the initial uh, wave function with the um, non-Hermitian Hamiltonian until the norm squared of the wave function drops below this random number, um, one half in my example. And then there's a stochastic process to determine which jump operator we then um, apply. Um, and then we apply that jump operator. Um, and then we will, let's say if we were here in the singlet, we would then emerge in this case. Then we generate another random number. Um, we evolve until the norm of the wave function squared drops below that random number. And then we make another jump. The other jump could be back down, it could be up and so on. In between jumps, the uh, evolution, as I emphasized, is, is always at fixed L and C. And because of this, we don't. We can then uh, decompose uh, the density matrix in YLMs, and we can write this H effective as, a, as an effectively one-dimensional Hamiltonian acting on one-dimensional wave functions, which are the reduced wave functions. So during the H effective evolution, this is very efficient. You won't, to solve the full 3D problem, you only need to solve a one-dimensional uh, real-time Schrodinger equation with a complex Hamiltonian. And then you make a jump is simply applying some differential operator to that wave function. And then you can continue in this manner and get the full 3D solution to the, to the Lindblad equation. Now, the, the nice thing about this uh, way of solving the Lindblad equation is that each of these um, possible um, realizations of the quantum trajectory, which is a set of random numbers, essentially, are completely independent. So I can, um, I can start these runs on a thousand different computers. Um, and then in the end, I just average over the results that I get from those thousand different computers. And that will give me the prediction for the, for the, the evolution of the density matrix. The additional um, benefit here is because um, I'm always existing only in a discrete um, angular momentum state, there is no need to even um, truncate the, the basis here. So I can, I, can have, I can remove the angular momentum cutoff completely. But because these are independent, this problem is what's called embarrassingly parallel. As I said, if you have a thousand computers, you can just run it a thousand times with those thousand computers, collect all the results and, 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 and keep going. So it scales perfectly. Good. 
Now, of course, in order to evolve a wave function, we have to have an initial condition. So in the papers that we've produced thus far, and <laughs> what we've done is, is assume that we're in the high energy limit. And in the high energy limit, we expect that because of the large quark mass that uh, heavy quarkonium production is local and will be essentially a delta function in space. Now, putting a delta function into a numerical uh, simulation is difficult, so we need to smear that delta function in some way. There's also physical reasons that we'll, we would have smearing because, you know, the, the mass really isn't infinite. Um, so what we take is, is, is a form of the following, where L here is the initial angular momentum of the state, uh, angular momentum quantum number, and then delta is this sort of artificial width that we put in. Now the computation becomes more and more um, expensive. We need a larger and larger lattice as delta <laughs> goes to zero. Um, so we had to try to make some, some measurements like what would happen. So what's plotted here is the, the survival probability of the 1S um, with a, a real delta function minus this Gaussian onsatz divided by the real delta function in the case where we could do it as a function of time. And then this is reducing um, this delta down to a point where we had less than 1% um, change between a true delta function and the smeared delta function. And the same thing holds true for the excited states on the right. I show you what happens with the 3S. So we're gonna use this smeared delta function. Um, and in the numerical paper, if you're interested, we I plotted the dependence on this delta of the final results for RAA. And what you find, of course, if delta is too big, then it affects the results. But after a while, the, the results do not depend on, on this delta at all. All right, so now for, now for phenomenology, we need to fold this together with a realistic um, three-dimensional evolution of the quark long plasma. What we've done so far is only two-dimensional. The code, the hydro code itself is 3D. It has X, Y, and uh, rapidity dependence. But because of you know, the computational demands so far, we've only looked at, at central rapidities at Y is equal to zero. And then what we do is we sample a bunch of initial uh, production points, not all at once, one at a time. I just show you an ensemble of them here. And we also sample their transverse momentum from um, sort of a, a, a toy model for the, for the uh, one over uh, ET to the four spectrum. And then we propagate them along, uh, recording uh, the temperature along each of these trajectories. And then we go back and we, and along each of those physical trajectories, we then average over a large set of quantum trajectories by generating this series of random numbers here. So that's what's stated here. Along each physical trajectory, we then solve this re real-time 3D uh, Schrodinger equation with a complex potential and stochastically sampled jumps. Now, at some point, um, these states will leave the plasma. They'll enter a region where the temperature is low enough that they will decouple and uh, essentially uh, undergo vacuum evolution. And at that point, uh, what we do is we, we measure the overlap between the, the vacuum um, eigenstates indexed by N and L with the wave function that was uh, generated from the solution, and then um, normalize that by the initial uh, overlap. And that gives us what we call the survival probability for the state with uh, quantum numbers N and L. Now, in, in practice, um, what we found was that, you know, with this delta function during the during the um, during the initial evolution, this thing spreads out a lot in space, and so you need an actually a very large box. <laughs> so in practice, we use a, a one-dimensional solver um, with four thousand ninety-six points in 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 the one dimension, and the box size is one hundred and eight times um, a naught. Again, if you go to the numerical paper, you can see how things depend on these two assumptions and also on the, the time step size. And these were chosen by essentially um, in doubling every time and, until we found that the results didn't depend on the, on the parameters that we chose for the simulation. So once these survival probabilities are extracted, um, that's not the end of the story because this, the state might have escaped the QGP, but it can still, um, if it's an excited state, for example, it can still decay down. 
So the, the next stage that we need to um, we needed to implement was was the feed down stage. And for that, we can construct a, a feed down matrix, which comes um, from numbers that you can just read out um, from the PDG. Um, so each of the, 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 the well, there will be a column vector here, which corresponds to all of the, the states, the 1S, the 2S, the 3, 1P states, the 3S, the 3, 2P states, and the 2D. And this is the branching fraction from 2S into 1S, for example. So these are all just branching fractions sitting here. And um, from, from our simulation, what we can do is then um, take the direct production cross-section. So this is before feed down occurs in PP. So this is the initial production. We then propagate them through the quark gluon plasma. We calculate their survival probability. C here stands for whatever observable class that you're looking at. It could be bins in centrality. It could be bins in PT, et cetera. And then we apply this feed down matrix to this. And then we normalize by the experimentally observed result scaled up um, appropriately. So that allows us to include this, this complicated effect of feed down that occurs at, at late times. Now, this can be important, for example, because if a large component, as you can see here, 30% of, of, of 1S production uh, in PP collisions comes from 2S feed down. And if you remove all of the 2S states by suppressing them completely, then you'll, you'll, you'll suppress the 1S by 30% just from that. So um, you have to take this into account. It is, it is, it's, a, you know, it's a large and measurable effect and, and you need to include it in your simulations if you want to compare with data. All right, so Nor Norris showed some of these plots uh, yesterday. I'll just run through them quickly and show you in um, some additional ones. So again, after running it through the feed down, we then have a prediction for uh, the RAA, which is the experimentally observed suppression of the states. And here is uh, n part. So over here is a peripheral collision, and over here is a central collision. And there's data, which are the black points here, um, and the, um, the white points down below for the 1S and the 2S. And these come from all three of these collaborations, Alice, Atlas, and, and CMS at this point in time. And the, the band um, here on the left is when we vary kappa within um, the range that we determined from the lattice measurements, and we keep gamma fixed as its central value. Um, and the central line is, is using those central values. And as we can see here, we have a quite reasonable description of the experimental data. Um, on the right shows the same, but now varying gamma. Um, the central lines here are, are, of course, the same because the central values are the same. But as we can see, there's a larger variation with, with gamma. And that, that's probably just associated with the fact that our uncertainty, theoretically, for gamma is much larger um, than it is for kappa at this moment in time. It does offer some hope, however, that by doing these measurements and uh, calculations and comparing them to the measurements that we could somehow constrain gamma um, through comparisons of theory um, to data. This um, Now, in addition to presenting the, the results as a function of n part, you can also integrate over all n part and get the total integrated suppression factors. And then you can compare those for the 1S, for the 2S, and for the 3S to experimental data. And um, with the exception of, of the 3S, um, all of these um, seem to lie within the error bars combined between theory and, um, and experiment. Now, the theory error bars come from the fact that we've only averaged over a finite ensemble of physical trajectories and quantum trajectories. Um, so th that's what the, the error bars that are, are sitting here are. Um, the first error bar is the uncertainty due to kappa and gamma variation, and this is the statistical error bar. As you can see with the number of samples that we had, the statistical error is quite small. It's on the order of the line width here in these lines. So the chief uncertainty now has been reduced down to the transport coefficients themselves. Now, as I said, um, looking here, we see a larger variation with, with uh, gamma. So um, that led us to, to look at um, what's called the double ratios. 
So if you look at the double ratio of the 2s to 1s, so this is the suppression of the 2s relative to the 1s defined here <laughs> formally. Um, the nice thing about this is it reduces some systematic uncertainties that the experimentalists have. Theoretically, the nice thing about it is that if I look on the left here for the 2s to 1s double ratio and I vary kappa around, I see very, very little variation of the result with kappa. The reason that this occurs is because increasing kappa suppresses both the 1s and the 2s sort of uniformly. And so the, it's a sort of correlated suppression. And, and when you take the ratio, it cancels out. On the right, however, we see that if we vary gamma around, um, we see a much larger variation of this double ratio um, with gamma. And that's because gamma, again, it's related to the modification of the real part of the potential and then enters into sort of quantum mixing of the states, which can be different for the, the different 2s and 1s and 3s states. And that's why you see a larger variation here. And the same hold true, tr holds true for the 3s to, to 1s double ratio. And again, um, this is very promising because here, you, you, if with increased experimental statistics, you, um, you might actually be able to pin down this coefficient gamma hat through just experimental observations. That's the hope. In the second paper in this series, which came out um, in July of, of 21, um, we, as I described before, we sampled also the PT. So we could also get the, the transverse momentum dependence of, of RAA. And once again, we, we found reasonable uh, agreement with the data um, and, in, and likewise, the, the, the variation with gamma was larger for the 1S than, than it was with, with kappa. Now, one of the um, nice things that happened in the last, uh, let's say five years um, is that the experiment, all the exper all there's three experiments now, <laughs> uh, Atlas, Alice, um, and CMS all collecting data on, on bottomonium suppression. And the statistics are, are becoming large enough that they can now start to extract the elliptic flow of these states. Why is this interesting? Well, there was a surprise if you measure the, uh, a few years ago, if you measure the elliptic flow of the JSI, you find a rather large elliptic flow coefficient. And it's on the same order of magnitude as the elliptic flow seen in the, in the light work sector. So this was evidence somehow that JSI was thermalizing and flowing with the medium. Um, now, the, there was, of course, a question, well, is bottom going to do the same? And Alice um, measured this and admittedly at this point in time with, with somewhat large error bars. But as you can see, it, it's basically flat and near zero. Early models from Texas A&M, Ralph Rapp's group, and, and myself and collaborators, um, just for bottom, we, we predicted that this, in, in fact, was going to be a very, very small um, number. The experimentalists are now also measuring this as a function of PT, and we're hoping that um, this can be used to um, tell different models apart eventually. At this point in time, I would say that the experimental uh, error bars are, are a little bit large for this, but you can hope in the future with more statistics that we would at least be able to, you know, rule out models A or B. So we can, uh, we can now calculate this with the, with this quantum trajectories code, um, QTRAJ here for short. This is the um, V2 um, from the, from our calculations for the 1S in, um, in various centrality classes binned exactly the same way that the experimentalists do. The um, shaded bands are, again, the variation, um, in this case, with kappa. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. This is varying gamma on the left, sorry. And this is, I switched it up for some reason. And this is varying kappa on the right. Um, error bars of the experimental data are, are large, but we're within the error bars. If you integrate over all centralities, though, we have a very, um, let's say constrained prediction. And the hope is that with increased statistics, we can start to, to test to see if this is really um, compatible with, with the data. Not only can we do this for the, for the 1S, uh, we can also do it for the excited state. So here are predictions for the to 2S and 3S flow. And once again, they're integrated um, uh, 
values are highly constrained and they don't have much uh, dependence on kappa and gamma or the, or the statistics. And hopefully with increased experimental statistics, this rather large error bar that's sitting here will, will go down and we'll see um, if eventually it moves in the direction of, of the prediction or not. Um, we'll learn something either way. Now, one of the, um, the issues that we faced when we were doing this calculation was that, as I said earlier, we made a kind of truncation in the beginning to get this simple, uh, simple form um, for the Lindblad equation and the simple form for these jump operators. And that was that we truncated um, at zero order in the binding energy um, over the temperature. So we're assuming that the binding energy is much, much smaller than the temperature. Now in practice, um, that need not be true. Um, and uh, we won't trust this, um, this solution. Uh, we don't trust the underlying equation itself um, below a temperature of around 250 MeV. So that's what we used as the cutoff before we just stopped the evolution at 250 MeV. Now this was a little bit, um, how should I say, I, I didn't like it <laughs> because it's rather high and there's a long period where the, the plasma continues to evolve. And we see that there's a, you know, a, a, an uncertainty related to what we choose for this, this final temperature. And of course, we want it to go lower. We want to get this down to, let's say, the, the QGP um, transition temperature. So to do that, we need to seriously look at um, this expansion and see how well it converges and see what happens if we include the next to leading order terms in the binding energy over temperature. Um, this at those low temperatures is not uh, necessarily a small quantity. So we, we, need to, we need to really look at this and then Formally, um, it allows us to go beyond what's called the recoilless limit and include also drag effects in, in the simulation. So this will, in, in Yukana's table that he presented yesterday, allow us to, uh, by his definition at least, put a check mark next to dissipation. So now we'll have full non-abelian evolution, um, 3D, and with, with dissipation. Um, one caveat is that at strict next leading order, so if you were to just take the Lindblad equation, it, uh, the master equation itself, and truncate at just linear order in E over T, you will find that it can't be cast in Lindblad form. However, it's possible to include terms, just take the jump operators, um, truncate them at E over T, and then, um, and then put together everything, and then include essentially some terms which are beyond the order that you're working at. We call this next to next to leading order completion. Um, you can then um, cast this in Lindblad form again. Now, to the best of my knowledge and, and the people in the audience are experts um, within PR NRQCD, the first next to next to leading order completed <laughs> next to leading order Lindblad equation was presented in, in Yukonau's pa uh, review paper um, from, from 2020. And um, I'll show that on the next slide, but um, if you can do this, and then again, assume an isotropic uh, medium, you can then use a spherical wave function basis, and then you can now solve this next leading order Lindblad equation in exactly the same way as we did before, only with a more complicated um, H effective and more complicated jump operators. So here's, um, you can actually showed at least part of this in his talk yesterday. Um, this is, well, the top is just the Lindblad equation itself. This is the, the modification of the real part. His notation is slightly different in this paper. This, this S is what we call gamma, and, and this gamma is what we call kappa. Um, and then it has some color structure. Um, and then there are, um, these different jump operators, which encode the singlet to octet, octet to singlet, and octet to octet. And they involve these quantities V tilde in, in Euclid's notation, which are, are now um, these next to leading, or which give us the next to leading order jump operators. These two terms are um, the next to leading order terms. If we were to drop them away, this would just be R. And if we were to drop this one, this would just be R. And that would take us back to the, the leading order thing that we had. At the same time, we would need to drop this anti-commutator term. Um, that's also a next leading order term formally. 
Um, and that would take us back to what we had before. But now what we want to do is, is solve this. So we went through the, the derivation independently. Um, the starting point is to essentially take this, um, uh, this quantity A here, which is related to sort of the, the, um, this integral of the, of the chromoelectric correlator. And now instead of um, truncating at leading order, when we expand these exponentials to include this um, next, this uh, leading order correction here. And in the end, you can write down exactly a, a, an, an evolution equation of Lindblad form with now updated jump operators. The, the, they exactly agree with what you can uh, um, use, but we just changed the notation to, to um, coincide with what we used. And um, also there was a slightly different normalization for the states, but in the end, it's exactly the same. And we can see here that um, entering into these jump operators is the difference in the energy between the octet and singlet the configuration. And um, yeah. Now, one complication is that um, because the Hamiltonian here now contains this anti-commutator term that mixes um, momentum and space, um, we, we can't use the same evolution algorithm that we used in the previous papers, which was a kind of Suzuki Trotter method based on fast Fourier transforms. So what I'll show you here is Crank Nicholson, but I'll show you that um, at least at leading order, if we use Crank Nicholson or this FFTW, at least for the lattices we have, it doesn't make a difference. It's just slower with Crank Nicholson by roughly a factor of two. So um, in order to translate this sort of formal uh, thing. This are now re written in terms of the Cartesian components, you know, so this is X, Y, and Z, this is PX, PY, and PZ, and, and so on. Um, we want to reduce it down to a one-dimensional equation again. Oops. So what we're going to do is uh, rewrite um, the entire equation in terms of, um, of the reduced uh, effective 1D uh, wave function, which is just R times uh, capital R, if you remember from quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics class. And of course, the full wave function has another product of a YLM hanging off of this, but you can just get rid of the YLM in the end. So um, in this case, once you go to the reduced um, wave function basis, you can write down explicit expressions for these jump operators. So this is sing singlet to octet going up in angular momentum by one uh, unit. This is the same thing going down and so on and so on. So we have six Lindblad operators um, and they depend on now because of these additional uh, differential operators, they depend on the angular momentum of the state and they're just some differential operators here. Again, all of these terms that are sitting here, except for the R, those are all the next to leading order terms in our, in our language. Yeah, Mike, can I, yes. can I interrupt you very quickly? <laughs> like yes. we, we're already five minutes past the- Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, wrap up. gonna be done in, in two slides. Thank okay, you. thanks. I, I can't see a clock, so <laughs> it's just, it's a bad thing about Zoom. Okay, so um, skipping over this technical slide, you can, from those jump operators, reconstruct the widths and, and that, that will tell you how to choose which jump operator that you're going to apply when the jumps are triggered. So this is the, the punchline plot. So what's shown here is a, a realistic simulation. Again, the same hydro background now for a zero to 5% centrality uh, collision. We, I averaged over 100,000 quantum trajectories. The grid size was 2, 248 and, and, and so on. And um, this is the next to leading order result that we get, the green up here for the 1S state. And these are the, the two different numerical algorithms, either Suzuki Trotter or Crank Nicholson down here, just to show you that we, we're not sensitive to the, to the, the way in which we solve the, the H effective evolution. As we can see for the 1S, this is on the order of a 30% enhancement. Um, I just kept the, the final temperature at 250 MeV here. Um, we see an even larger enhancement for the 2S and the 3S. So it's going to be important to uh, include these and then um, Hopefully, we'll be able to go down to even lower temperatures and provide a, a better description of the data. And with that, I come to my conclusions and outlook slide. Um, I'll just try to hit two points here. So in the, in the published work, we now have the full 
first full 3D quantum and non-abelian treatment within this open quantum systems framework. And we've been able to do it with purely classical computers, many of them. I'm typically running on a thousand computers at any time. Um, so it's not very good for the environment, let's say, but um, it allows us to get the, the calculation done. If you're interested in the code, um, it's released publicly. You can go to this Bitbucket site and download it yourself. Um, the 2.0 version, which includes now these next to leading order terms, is near completion and we're writing the paper. Um, it's already available on Bitbucket. If you want to look at that, you can go and look at the next to leading order branch. And with that, I'm sorry for going over time. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Any questions from the audience? Um, Yasin just raised his hand. Yasin? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, really remarkable results. Um, so yeah, I, ha I have a question, but let me first start with another question. Is, is this the end of the uh, story? I mean, you, you're describing the data, so it's, um, you know, quite, um, you know, satisfactory. Yeah, I don't, right? I, I think it's not the end of the story. I think it's, you know, now we have to check, as you and I said yesterday, there's some, there's underlying assumptions here, which we need to start testing what, what are the, the corrections, right? So, so as we can see, there's a 30% correction here, just by including the next to leading order terms in E over two. Oh, okay. So then that's my question, that not my, my real question. So you mentioned adding those, uh, you know, next to leading order correction, you showed those bands, you know, by varying yeah. the temperature, you were not happy with that. Uh, but uh, what, what's the effect then of adding that uh, next to leading order and varying the temperature? Would, would you see, uh, you know, an improvement uh, over, or yeah, how this plot is, uh, how is it uh, improved after adding the, the NLO? Yeah, I, I don't have that plot to show you yet. Um... What I can tell you is basically we can run to lower temperatures, which is what we wanted to do in the first place because the cutoff that we had was just really too high. Um, but now we can we can lower this cutoff down to let's say the vicinity of the QGP phase transition, say 150, 180 MeV, um, and then we can describe the data. Um, but then you can vary there, right? Still. You but then still... we can vary that around, and I don't have that plot yet for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> you have no intuition or you know any guess about how you know. But I guess no. it would improve it, right? Just the fact that you lower the you know the cutoff temperature that would improve the uh, I guess the. Uh, it, it improves it on a conceptual level that I we just did, I didn't like the fact that we had to you know essentially terminate the evolution at such a high temperature, and that's because this leading order. Um, truncation dramatically overestimates the width. Mm -hmm. But that's an uncertainty that you would, you know, you could add on top of your, you know, calculation to. Yeah. You know. So that that's what we're doing now. And the other yeah. thing, as you can point it out, is that, you know, the whole dipole approximation itself, you might, you might, uh, especially for the excited states, you might have some doubt about yeah. that. We want to systematically now try to go beyond that approximation. Right. So, I, yeah. I think it's a good starting point for the future. <laughs> you know, we can now start to try to include these extra terms and, and see if we can still, you know, agree with the data. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yasin, for the questions. Any other question from the audience? Yeah, Median, can you just unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, uh, hi, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so my question may be naive. So uh, we will talk about using the quantum trajectory method to solve the Lindblad equation. So there's a non-unitary part of mm -hmm. the equation. Is the non-unitarity uh, on purpose or it's some price one has to pay to realize some other feature that one wants. No, no, it's on purpose and it, it, it reflects physics, which is the breakup of these states. Without this non-unitary evolution, you, you would never trigger these drop, jumps, right? Um, it, it, it is physics. Now, now, one way to understand the fact that you get non-unitary evolution is to imagine that you, you had a bottomonium state that was propagating through some medium, right? And you try to evolve its, its wave function, but you need to now average over all possible configurations of the medium quantum mechanically. 
And what can happen is that is the wave function uh, can then interfere with itself. <laughs> um, and, and that's okay. what's really underlying this, this non-unitary uh, evolution. So no, it's yeah. physics here. It's not an artifact. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so if you only have the first term, so no quantum jump, then the probability of the system itself will decrease over time, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. but and with the way we understand that, right, is that essentially, um, well, the whole evolution will be unitary, but you can have things that live in this block that are then transitioning into this block, right, or it's free states, right? So there's no reason for the evolution within either of these blocks individually to be unitary. Okay, I see. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, Mike, I have a question, a bit technical. Like when you right. do the quantum jumps, um, like what, what, what are the states that are jumping? No, I mean, I'm asking like, what, what is the basis when you implement the jump? Yeah, so the, the way the code works is that it's, it's just discretized in space. So we just have a discrete representation of, of the wave function, U, the reduced wave function. And then um, it, at leading order, the jump is just, take that evolved wave function that I evolved up to the point of the jump and I just multiply it by R. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. At next to leading order, it's, it's slightly more complicated. <laughs> I have to apply these differential operators to that, that discrete wave function. Okay. And, and, and how does the angular momentum change? Like we see, for example, in this case, when you have L plus one, you, you, you raise the angular momentum by one? Or? Yeah, so, so uh, the angular momentum ah. changes are encoded in these arrows here. So this is a transition up in angular momentum, and this is the, is the L of the state that you're transitioning from. Okay. And, and at leading order, you also have this rising and lowering of the angular momentum. Yeah, we did, but, but they're, at leading order, they're all the same. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, any other question from the audience? Mm. Yeah, if not, uh, we can thank Mike again and uh, you can ask uh, questions. You can ask more questions during the discussion time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike.